Hey now, hey now, hey now, what's going on everybody? Hey now, hey now, hey now, how's everybody doing? Welcome to another week of the Uni to Horror podcast. And uh, me, me and Nick have been talking about doing a different kind of episode, Nick. We've been going a year and some change. Now it's time to put another, what, put, put some more seasoning into the pot, I guess, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, today's episode is going to be, uh, I don't know if you guys ever, uh, it was called Everybody Hates Chris. Today's topic is Everybody Hates Nick, and uh, we're going <laughs> to get to the bottom of why that is. So uh, join we, us. How much time do you have? <laughs> oh, shit. <clears throat> no, so this is funny. I asked my wife uh, months ago, Christian asked me, he's like, hey, man, like, how would you feel about doing like a like an episode where we just talked about like some true crime and this, this was a while ago. And I was like, dude, that'd be cool. Like, cause I fucking love true crime. I listen to podcasts literally all the time. Um, I think a lot of us do, which is, I don't know. We have a fascination with it, whatever. And, uh, I was like, yeah, dude. And I texted Christian today and I said, Hey, like, what are we doing? He's like, man, I don't know. Like what did it hit me with some ideas? And I was like, true crime. And I was talking to my wife about it. And she's like, I don't know if you guys are really, the people for that and i was like what is that supposed to mean because she's like an aficionado it's all she does is listen well she doesn't know me i know and she goes i don't know if you guys are really the people for that i'm like what do you mean she's like i feel like you guys would laugh about some stuff and no. this, stuff, this stuff isn't funny and i'm like no and she's like i don't know and i was like well we're gonna eventually so but yeah she doesn't understand that like I know Christian's a big fan of true crime. Um, I'll tell you when we're done recording what example she gave me as to why she thinks that we shouldn't talk about true crime. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But um, no, like it wouldn't be like an episode like where we're like, okay, today's episode is about Ted Bundy. Theodore Robert Bundy was born. No, it's not. it wouldn't be like that. We just talk about some fucking serial killers and shit and like, you know, some gnarly stuff. But we settled on Unsolved Mysteries. Christians right. pulled up some unsolved mysteries that we're going to pontificate about. And what'd you say? Come to our own conclusions about how it will wrap up or. Right. Cause I think that would be fun also for the audience because as they're listening, they're going to be coming, they're going to have their own ideas and of what the outcomes could possibly be. And they'll see if they're jiving with us or if they have another idea and then they could comment down below their thoughts on some of this stuff. I, and I love unsolved mysteries. Also, it's good to talk about this stuff because if they're still unsolved talking about it, not that we're going to solve anything, but talking about these things keeps them going, keeps them alive, keeps the conversations going. And sometimes that's what it takes for some, some of this stuff to, uh, to get, uh, you know, resolvement. So I, I just think we're doing the Lord's work here tonight, quite frankly. But yeah, the, the Lord's work, Satan's work, Whoever's work, we're we're gonna do it. Uh, but obviously, as we always start, you know, introductions, uh, what the fuck's been up, and all that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we we did we did our uh, ranking the big three tonight on my channel. Christian, Justin, and I did. We uh, ranked out of all thirty three movies, what was the worst and what was the best. Yeah. <clears throat> why why is Leatherface always excluded? Like why why is it not just the big four? Is it because it's too many movies? You think is part of it? You think three is enough? Or well, I one I think three is enough, but I also think that Leatherface is like, in some ways, kind of a bastard child because only like you, me, a lot of like you know hardcore horror fans might find enjoyment in a lot of those sequels. But let's be honest, like the casual audience only knows like the original the remakes like right they don't That's know fair. everything in between and he's so not it, he's leatherface is arguably a slasher icon anyway i don't see him as a slasher icon because of the leatherface that i love is the scared family member that acts out of fear unlike some of the entries so i guess i can see that <laughs> well I how think you'll be happy to know i put i put um put freddy's revenge at number three um out of all of them uh, but yeah, Rob Zombie's Halloween two was number two, and obviously I had Halloween at one. Uh, Justin not Texas and I Chainsaw Massacre. You didn't put Texas Chainsaw Massacre at number one. 
Oh shit! I'm sorry. There is no Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. What am I saying? Fuck! I'm sorry. I've got yeah, no, I got yeah, Leatherface. Yeah. Um, on. I'm wearing a Leatherface shirt today too. <laughs> I've got Texas I'm, Chainsaw uh, on the brain. McLovin. McLovin. But, um. Yeah. Yeah. No. It was fun, man. It was cool. I I didn't realize that like it's such an undertaking because that's a lot of fucking movies. And Did, I was like, oh I'm shit. Ass- I'm assuming you either put Resurrection or Freddy's Dead at Dead Last. Dead was Dead Last. <clears throat> yep okay. yeah and i even referenced you i even referenced you when we were live i was like i know i'm gonna you know if christian were in here he'd tell me i was wrong but hey you know this is this is what it is but uh well that is man, why people Friday- that is why people don't like you nick because uh you tell everybody they're wrong apparently right are we gonna address I that or what? <laughs> you know I Dude, think I like look. No, can no I, let, we can let me, really quick. We can let me speak up for you, okay? Because <laughs> that comment made me laugh so hard when the guy was like, you know, Nick, I could see why people will give you shit. We ham it up on the show. Believe me, Nick is <laughs> Nick does not think he has the strongest uh, opinions in the world. He's here here's the, here's one thing though, Nick. You are the little brother of this show. And I think naturally people prefer to fuck with you than me. Oh, yeah. And I think that's part of it. And look, I'm a little brother, so I grew up with it. So I got to be honest. I enjoy when you talk about, well, I like the font on Black Christmas. And then the chat literally turns everything into <laughs> Nick Love's font. I mean, to me, it's hysterical. So, I mean, take that in stride. Okay. Like if, if they don't fuck with you, Nick. That means they really don't like you. They're fucking with you. That means they like you. But yeah, you but ham it up. I ham it up. We really, you know, you know, that's part the, of it. The thing, the thing with all that, though, okay, first of all, addressing the font thing, that was funny because I was trying to find something positive about that fucking movie. So I was like, the font's cool. Like, I I don't know. Um, would you guys want me to say the movie was cool? Because then you would all have been pissed because nobody likes that movie. But... Regardless, uh, I mean, I, it was tongue in cheek, but whatever. Um, and then, no, it's I, I am. A, I'm the middle child of nine of us. So, like, Jesus I know. Christ. Yeah, I know what it's like to have older siblings pick on you. So, like, I'm not a stranger to it. But yeah. And Justin, uh, I know he's listening right now. I didn't take offense to, to what you had to say because I know what you were saying. You were just like, man, I like. I know you weren't saying I want to give you a hard time. You were just saying like, I could see why some people might. Um, my issue was the people that liked that comment. Like, <laughs> you know, it was on. all, Tell you know, it was you probably are. all of our, it was probably people that thought it was funny. No, I know, well, but it's, it's just funny to me because it's like, I say all the time, like all the time, whether I'm talking like Halloween five, Halloween ends, like whatever it might be. I'm like, guys, I know this is not a popular opinion. And but you I'm go not for saying it. I'm right, but this is how I feel. And like, you know, Christian does the same thing with Freddy's dead, but nobody shits down his throat for, for that. <laughs> so it's just like, I don't know. Look, I really enjoy being transparent with our audience and keeping them up to keeping them up with everything. I think, you know, you've had a, you've been going through a lot and not that you've been in a bad mood or, or, or mean, obviously, but I think people could probably tell maybe over the last two or three months, like, come on, Nick, like pull yourself out of it, man. Like, I think people could probably tell because you did your best and you never wavered. I always give I always give you props when when uh, when I tell people like, dude, Nick is very persistent. He he's always on top of the show with me. It's not like I'm like, hey, let's keep doing this, which is why you're the perfect partner to have on the show. But, you know, you're doing good. I mean, I, I think people can tell, especially from the last couple episodes, like Nick's getting back in his groove. He's getting his shit together. And, you know, we're getting back on track. Not that you were doing a bad job, but I, th- I think you're smart enough to know, like, when you're going through stuff in life, you can try to put on a happy face. But, you know, you know what I mean? I'm sure I've, 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 I've probably been there myself, you know? No, yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very emotional person. I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve. So, like, as much as I try sometimes to to not show that it's, it's almost damn near impossible at times too much sometimes, but yeah, I mean, I I am definitely 
as we sit here today in, in a better doing, space doing and good. things are trending in the right direction. So like, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely, definitely more positive, but I, I do have to just say, I want to let everybody listening know I am never claiming that I am right. My opinions are my opinions. And um, yeah. So part of, part of doing a podcast too is after a while, look, here's the thing. We all have our opinions. We put out our reviews on movies, but the podcast has really turned into locker room talk, which is, I think why <laughs> people, no, I'm serious. And I think that's why people no, really stick with it is because they've gotten to where this is therapy for you and me this hour and some change. And we really feel like we can just let it out, which is why I don't like going live all the time, which we were talking about before. And cause I feel like we can really just be dead ass. And what you hear from me and Nick, we're obviously, here's the thing. When, if I say, and the audience is smart, they know this, but when, especially when people start seeing the show and they don't realize who we are yet, I can understand how it could be sometimes jo like, for instance, when you say, if you like Halloween ends, guys, it's cool. If you didn't like it, and I chime in with, go fuck yourself. Um, if somebody didn't know us, they could probably be like, God damn. But, and obviously that wasn't even you need a, that was just on your channel. But my point is it's locker room and I'm not being serious, but that's how we talk when we're not on cameras where everybody's like that. Not just you and me. Everybody talks locker room when they're with their people. They're a lot more harsher. They joke, they say ridiculous stuff. And that has obviously gotten into this podcast, which I will not waver and, and start playing, uh, you know, Mr. Political anymore. Cause that's not what the pod to me. If your podcast doesn't become more real as you do it, I think you're doing it wrong. That's just me personally. I think the more real <laughs> and nasty and locker room you get, because the audience has has gotten to know us now. The people that have been listening to this show, they know that when we're being over the top, they know. You know what I mean? So yeah, and, um, and that's that was kind of my thing with like anybody that might have taken that comment and been like. Yeah, fuck that Nick guy. You know, the, like the way I look at that is like, if you guys have listened to us for 81 episodes now, Two. you would know. Well, this will be 82. 80, 82. You would know that this is like literally our thing. Like we are very much ourselves and very authentic. We don't put on any kind of face for this. This is kind of how Christian and I just talk to each other anyway. But also in that authenticity, we ham it up at times when it comes to opinions, like because we know it'll ruffle feathers and it's funny to us. Like yeah, it's whether funny. we're trying, yeah, whether we're trying to upset each other or upset others, like it's funny sometimes. We're not actually saying that that's how we feel. Like, but every now and then, like your comment, you said, when I said, if you didn't like Halloween ends and you go, go fuck yourself, like <laughs> you're obviously just trying to be funny. But if somebody didn't know you, they would have been like, fuck that guy. Right. My opinion doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like if you've been listening long enough, you know how the dynamic here goes. And like, if you haven't been listening long enough, we've got 81 other episodes and multiple live streams on each other's channels. So probably well over a hundred videos um, that you could just kind of see how the dynamic works and understand, oh, okay, this is how they are. They're not actually like pretentious douchebags because we're, we're not at all like that's quite the opposite of what Christian and I are. The, so, and the beauty is if you, if let's say you've, you're seeing this video now, maybe because it's an unsolved mysteries episode, watch the trajectory of our vocabulary from the start of the podcast. And then go to, go, go to episode two or three. Cause the first episode, the audio is not really great. It was the first one. It's a little awkward, but like go to episode two. And then go to episode 15, then pull up episode 30, episode 55, and it just it goes from PG to PG-13 <laughs> to R to hard R to NC-17, yeah. basically. So Because that's how it started, guys. Christian was like, we got to keep this, as, you know, not, not G, but just keep it family friendly. And then after like a few episodes, Christian was like, fuck it. Like it's, that's not who we are. And if, you know, if, if YouTube's going to kind of bury our podcast, 
because we're being ourselves, well, then who gives a shit? But honestly, the opposite has happened. So, yeah. And I think that that was always the route, right? The right route to go. Uh, after a few episodes, <laughs> us realizing we should just lean into who we are and how we actually talk. Because if you felt like you guys were watching a podcast where we were putting on a front, I don't think it would have it would be what it is. Like, no, absolutely I think not. People, they'd just be like, yeah, but this, this doesn't seem organic. Like we've literally, how many times have I taken my shirt off or, or uh, we've danced on camera or like it, fuck it, dude, we're just going to like do what we're going to do. And uh, there was one time where Christian, we were about to hit record. This was, I think last week. And uh, I got up to turn my TV down and I came back to sit down and I had my bare ass out in front of the camera. And Christian was like, dude, you should just start one of the episodes like that once. Like, just fucking, and like, I'm considering it. So, like, you know, it's just, it's who we are. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm ready to have a good time tonight, guys. So, Nick, I'm assuming you grew up watching some unsolved mysteries. Did you ever check out any of the Netflix reboot, as it were? of the unsolved mysteries. Uh, yeah, I watched the, uh, I want to say it was a season because I'm pretty sure they did them in seasons. Mm -hmm. I watched the entire first season with my wife when it came out a while back. And I remember her and I had a discussion afterwards and we were both like, fuck this. And it wasn't cause it wasn't good. Cause it is good. It pisses me off to no end because I have OCD like I'm very OCD about certain things. And one of them is like, I, I need finality. Like I need closure to things. And These are every, so basically every, uh, every unsolved mysteries episode is an A24 thing. Yes. And it's antithetical <laughs> to how I am as a fucking human being. Right. So I get to the end of every episode and I'm like, why? And, uh, it was one of the reasons why the first time I saw, um, David Fincher's Zodiac, I was so like, I knew it was a great movie that I had just watched, but I was so mad because I was like, who's the Zodiac? Now, obviously, we know now that it was, you know, the that big old dude, dude glasses. Yeah. yeah, like we know it was him now, although he never came out and said it. We know now it was him. But like, it pisses you off watching that movie because you're like, it's this guy. Like, it's right. totally this guy. But you don't get that closure. And it, oh, it's bullshit. Yeah, I watched uh, the first season. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the alien episode of the people, the kids from the 50s. Uh, I thought that was a really compelling episode. Um, yep. A lot of uh, dissension on that. A lot of viewers think that they're full of shit. Um, others believe it to be true. Uh, I don't know. You know that fire in the sky? Yeah, I was going to say that, like, dude, for me, like, when those fire in the sky dudes legitimately in real life pass that, uh, they all pass the lie detector test. To me, it's like, well, God damn it. I know lie detectors aren't used in court, but the, at the same time, you know, I, Jesus Christ, they're, they, they all passed it with flying colors. I mean, you got to think about it, man. Like, how big is the galaxy? We don't even have an idea. We don't even have an idea. There's no, got to be life out that's, there. That's just our galaxy. You know right. how many galaxies there are in this fucking universe? That, that's the crazy thing, too. I try to tell my mom this because she is, like, super hardcore Christian. And, like, I'm a Christian, too. I don't go to church or anything. But that's what I believe. And, like, I told her, she's like, she basically thinks that, like, nah, man, the Bible says that God created earth and humans so that's all there is and i'm like that doesn't mean that's all there is though it just means that in this galaxy in this solar system that's what was created right what about all the other solar systems and all the other galaxies throughout the <laughs> fucking universe like yeah. there's we but like mathematically speaking it is a, a mathematic impossibility that we're the only living beings in the universe it is a mathematical impossibility like right Earth is not the only planet that has life. It might be millions of light years away, but no, there's absolutely life somewhere. Now, whether that's little green men or, or maybe people that look just like us, who, the, who knows? But yeah, we're not the only living things in this universe. And I, I just, anybody that thinks at this point too, like anybody that thinks we are like, I just, 
the odds aren't in your favor. I think right. you're you're yeah, I think if you don't think they are, I think there's a possibility it's because you're scared of the idea of it. So you're you know, I you know, I could go in a lot of different directions with this and get really fucked up and say maybe religion is just a way for everybody to try to cope with death. It, it, it is and it, it definitely is. Uh that doesn't mean it's not real, but Maybe it blew up as much as it did because it gave a lot of people something to latch on to. Um, I, I still I don't know what everybody believes happens when you die, but I will say this. My wife, who is is an atheist, um, like she doesn't believe in, in God or anything like that. And, and I you know, have Christian beliefs and we cope because. At the end of the day, even her as an atheist, she believes that this is not it. Uh, what is it? Uh, energy or matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So like when you die, whether it's your stream of consciousness, whether it's uh, whatever it is, you got to go on somewhere. Uh, part of you has to go on somewhere. Do you come back as a fucking tree? Is it a, a legitimate afterlife? It, like who do you just get born again? Like who knows? But like, Something's got to happen. Um, but yeah, it, I think it definitely is a way for people to, I don't know, make themselves feel better, I guess, to be like, I hope it's not the case. I know that for a fact, man. You know what I mean? What? I hope there's, I, I hope that's that there, I just hope that there is a God and afterlife. But here's the thing. Well, guess what? If you're wrong, we're all going to the same place. <laughs> so, you know my, what I mean? My it's thing like, is, yeah. This is where it, the lot. This is where I've talked to my mom about this too. Mom, what is your idea of heaven? And she'll tell me blah 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 blah. And I was like, well, that's not my idea of heaven. And if heaven is this most perfect place on earth, isn't perfect subjective to an individual? So, my idea of heaven would be absolutely totally different from yours, mom. So, like, what happens? You're going to tell me that there's something that every human beings can't agree on a goddamn thing. You know, that's why God invented chilies. So when you don't know where to eat, everybody just says, fuck it, let's go to chilies. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what is heaven? You know, that's something I wonder. So I, I my heaven is literally just getting in a time machine when I'm dead and be having the ability to drop myself in 1984 and go see Children of the Corn in the theaters and then, you know, pay 30 cents for a hamburger. And then maybe tomorrow I'll go back to 2007 go to Blockbuster and rent Hostel and go to Six Flag. Like, you know, that's my idea of it is being able to just time jump whenever I want and do things without messing with any kind of space time continuum. That's yeah. how, and, you know, and I, I think at the end of the day, you know, we don't want to go too far off the rails because we really could talk about this forever. But um, I think at the end of the day, the, the, the idea is just like, I mean, be a decent person. Like don't yeah. be a fucking asshole. And like, like whatever that a shitty person, your 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 next life, whatever that might be, probably won't suck. Now, if you're a shitty person, you'll come back as like a stink bug or something. Like, I mean, that you know sucks to suck. But as far as like the aliens thing goes, is like, I just don't think that at this point, I, even my mom, like the, the last when she was here for Christmas and we were talking about it, you know, like her stance on it has basically become, I, I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, it doesn't really concern me and everything right. like that. And it's like, because it's just getting to a point where it's really fucking hard to say that it's not real. Like you got the Pentagon over the past few years, releasing video of unidentified flying objects. Are, we don't know what the fuck this was. And it's like our military is telling us, yeah, there's some shit that like, we just, we don't know. Um, so Did a singer blink One Eighty Two basically get the government yeah. to say, yep. I mean, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's just kind of like there's something out there. Uh, and yeah, I've heard things too where people would be like, maybe these aliens look at Earth and they're like, fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every other civilization, yeah, they you they you know, they fly into our atmosphere. That's how you get these UFOs, and they look around, they're like, Oh nah, fuck that shit. And they leave. So maybe that's why they haven't fucked with us because they're they're like Oh, your planet's dying and you're all assholes that can't agree with anything. And yeah, like, no, they're, they, they're cool on that. They don't want that. So yeah, just as well. 
Yeah, yeah, it probably is because if they did want that, who knows? It'd be like some fucking Independence Day shit or <laughs> War of the Worlds. I remember the first time I saw War of the Worlds, I was like, what would you even do, bro? Like, what would you even do? You're fucked. They're just vaporizing people. These giant ass tripods are just vaporizing people. Go hide in your basement. Doesn't matter. They'll send little creatures out of the fucking tripods to kill you. If you're out in the open, vaporize you. Step on your fucking house. Like, you're screwed. You're done for. Like, yeah, it's just, so it probably is for the best that they haven't, but selfishly before I die, would I like clarity on it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd love for it to be like some Mars attack shit, you know, where they come down and they meet the president and the queen and all that shit. Like, yeah, dude, I'd fuck, that'd be, that'd be killer just so we could be like, all right, these are the, but I do feel like it would be like what we did when, when we, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not going to rewrite history here. When we took America, uh, I feel like it would be like that where they'd be like, it's a nice piece of land you got there. Be a shame if someone took that from you, and then they'd kill us all, and then they just take the planet. Well, you know what they say: you'll never have justice on stolen land. Uh, yeah. Um. So. All right, Nick. Well, let's get into this, man. Uh, this is a short little one, but it's, I think it's a good way to kind of dip our toes in this. This is called the Tara Coleco case. Okay. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> on the morning of September twentieth, nineteen eighty-eight. In Belen, New Mexico, it seemed like a perfect day to ride a bike. Mm. Tara borrowed her mother's pink bike to go out for a spin. First mistake, pink bike. Extroverted and active, she worked as a bank teller. Don't prove your don't prove your wife right, by the way. Extroverted and active, she worked as a bank teller and was studying to become either a psychologist or a psychi psychiatrist. She planned to play tennis that afternoon and asked her mom to drive out, drive her out in case she got a flat tire and didn't hold on. I'm sorry. She planned to play tennis that afternoon and asked her mom to drive out after her in case she got a flat tire and didn't return home by noon. She never did return. Every lead went down to a dead end until a year later when a photo was found depicting a young woman, her age and a missing boy, both gagged. And they showed this photo. I won't show it here, but this woman, Tara and this young boy next to her are duct tape around the mouth and the arms. The Polaroid photograph was found in a parking lot outside a junior high, junior food, a, a junior food store in Florida. The nine-year-old Michael Henley went missing in the same area as Calico in April of 1988. When he, when he was hunting turkeys with his father. They appear to be in the back of a van with a copy of a book written by V.C. Andrews, Calico's favorite author, lying right beside the girl. Initially, Tara's mother didn't think the girl was her, but the girl in the photograph had a scar identical to Calico. But still, due to the lack of evidence, many experts dismissed this photograph. In 1990, Michael Hanley's body was found in Zuni Mountains where he was hunting which strongly disconnects the theory that the two were abducted and taken to Florida. Calico's parents would eventually die, never finding out who took their daughter. So the big question is, the picture of the girl and the boy, is it legitimate or not? Which I'm looking at this picture. I'll see if the camera... It's not... It's nothing uh, nude or anything. They have clothes on. But there's a picture of the girl and this boy... And they're duct taped their arms and their mouths. And there's Tara, uh, like a high school photo of her. So the question is, is the photo real or not? And did they go to Florida? My thing is, if it's legitimate, there's one thing that comes to mind. Sex traffic is why they were possibly in, why the photograph could have been found in Florida. And the the body of the boy could have been returned back to its home base after he was dead. It depends on how long the body was found after the boy had passed. Uh, but very interesting. I know that in the in the 80s, dude, people were getting abducted left and right for that human trafficking stuff. I mean, it still goes on now, but it was rampant in the 80s. <clears throat> yeah. And, and so, for me... One, the technology was nowhere near what it is now. Uh, what, that fucking damn near 40 years ago? 
So to, I mean, dude, that shit, that was actually over 40, wasn't it? 12, no, almost 40 years ago. Um, I, I don't know how or why someone would fake a photograph like that um, in that time period, mainly why, and then obviously how. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then you take in, you know, pedophile rings and, and sex trafficking rings at that time were rampant. I mean, all over the place. And it would make sense if they are like, oh, well, they, you know, they eventually found the boy's body where he went missing hunting. Yeah, it would make sense once they got done with someone or whatever to drop them in the area where they found them because you obviously don't want any tracks leading to you. Um, and so, it, you know, if, if the body's found a hundred miles away and then her body's found a few miles from that, well, then you can start as investigators putting two and two together and following a path and maybe finding these people that are responsible. So I have no reason to believe it's not legitimate. Um, I, yeah, I just, I don't see how or why it wouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, that's, I guess that's my piece on it. Cause here's the thing. The boy's body was found in the area where he initially went missing when he was hunting. That yeah. photograph was found in Florida. That doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you can consider. Just because a photograph was found in Florida doesn't mean that they were physically there, depending on who had the photograph. Maybe, oh, sure, yeah. maybe that photograph was for an, for lack of a word to describe somebody that I really don't want to use the words for. An exhibitor could have had the photograph to look at to see if they were interested in one of these people and thrown the photograph away. And, but at the same time, I don't know what the Zuni mountains look like, but if the boy's body was found in the Zuni mountains, which is where he was hunting a year and some change later, you're going to tell me that that boy's body wasn't thoroughly searched when he went missing in that area. And all of a sudden the body's discovered in that area a year and some change later. The only, the only possible explanation I could think of is the body was returned there. Cause that's I would have had, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I think happened. And I think that happened because like I said, you don't want any tracks leading to you. So when, if something happens or you get done with this, these people or whatever, you drop them near where you found them. Uh, Cause if they find them a hundred miles in another direction, well, they can start following that path right. and eventually maybe be led to the people responsible. Also, I don't know the details on this, but what state was the boy's body found in? You know what I mean? And I don't mean state like state in the United States. I mean, like, was he recognizable? Cause if he was, ain't no way he was dead for over a year in the fucking elements. It, he would have been completely unrec. He would have been bone. At that point, he would literally been bone because you'd have a year plus of weather conditions and a body just decomposing out in the open like that. Not to mention animals that would literally pick the meat off of the bone. Like, yeah, there you, you. So if his body was even found somewhat intact, there was no way he was dead that entire time in those mountains. No way. Like not a chance. Here's something else to consider, too. Why human trafficking was probably part of this. The parents eventually thought that the photograph that I showed on screen was not her, but there was in the photograph, a novel of the girls, the actual girls favorite author. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think being away from their daughter for a year and seeing her living in the conditions that she was, is going to physically alter the, the girl's appearance. Obviously her eyes, her face is going to completely change in some ways because of what she's going through. She's dead on the inside. The fact that there's the picture of the book that she loves from the author in the photo, to me, is a bargaining chip for her to comply. Like, hey, if you don't scream, don't act out, blah, 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 we'll give you a book from your favorite author 
as a reward. So that to me, this just has human trafficking all over it. And there was not just that. Go ahead. Well, to your point about the book, I was just going to say it could also have been a, it could have been a sick joke. It could have been like a, you know, this picture is going to get circulated. Like, you know, people are going to see this, you're, you know, whether you're trying to sell them or what the hell it be. And it might've been a wink and a nod to people that know her that might've seen that and been like, holy shit. That's like it, their sick way of being like, yes, this is who you think it is. And we have them like people that do these types of things. They have ways about that. They, they don't like to be completely anonymous. They don't like these crimes to go unnoticed. They get a sick sort of thrill right. by that. So they do. Okay, guys. So uh, let us know your thoughts below on the Tara Coleco case. And if she's still alive. Uh, yeah. Let's move. Let's move on to the severed foot mystery. And uh, Casey Anthony did it. All right. Go ahead, Christian. Did you see that document documentary about her on Peacock? Refuse, nah, refuse to watch that shit. How you would let her sit down and tell her, her truth. Get the fuck out of here. Get out of here. She killed her kid. I and, hold on though. Yeah. I I've got to get push back, dude. I'm not saying she didn't do it. She's obviously 100% involved in some way. She but knew at the very she, least she knew she was dead. Well, listen, let me tell you what she basically says in this. Her dad molested her her whole life. According to her, her brother also did too. And she basically says not only did the dad kill her, but she also believes the dad did bad things to her, his, her daughter as well. And she said we, they showed him speaking at the funeral for Kaylee about the dad. And again, I don't want, I don't want to sound like I'm saying she's innocent. No, the dad does sound pretty sick and twisted. While he's at the funeral, he started talking about missing her smell and the taste of her sweet sweat after she was playing outside. And it's pretty disturbing. The whole family seems to be pretty fucked. But I watched it. I, I couldn't keep away from it. I watched it the second it dropped, and I found it very, uh, very interesting. I, I probably will end up watching it because I'm a sucker for true crime. But I got to tell you that the way Peacock marketed it, I thought was fucked up i really did they marketed it and they put her in front and center like here's the truth here's my truth excuse me in the court of public opinion 99 percent of people think you are involved in this somehow i don't think that's how you should market that you're gonna piss a lot of no. people off from the get-go but on top of that i just think that there was way too too much there to say she had no culpability or didn't know how long did she wait before she reported her missing why was there Decom like remnants of decomposing flesh in her trunk. Like there was just so much that was just like you fucking Again. like, but she has an answer for all that is what was so interesting. The interviewers did an amazing job. They legitimately said, why didn't you say anything? And she goes, when I woke up that morning and my dad was like, she's, she was in the pool. He, she said that the dad, the dad brought her, the brought the kid into the house soaking wet. Like the kid, like she says what happened. Screw it. I'll just say it guys. She claimed the dad tried to physically do stuff to the kid because he's a sicko and the kid fought back and she thinks he choked the kid out and killed her, but then dunked her in the pool to make it seem like she drowned, ran back in the house, woke Casey up because she was asleep and said, hey, don't worry. Uh, he's... Let me stop for a second because it's a lot of moving parts. She said she woke up. He woke her up and said, come outside. They got the kid out of the pool and she was quote unquote lifeless. And that he told her, do not say a word. I'm going to make this all right. And he told her to lie. He told her to say the kid was with some Venezuelan broad. There was a weird name for it. She had a quote unquote answer for everything. Whether, whether she's telling the truth or not, of course, it's a totally different story. But it's interesting to watch because everything that you brought up, the interviewers were like, what about this? What about this? And she had an answer for everything. It's a very, very said, interesting to watch. 
And I would, and I'm going to watch it, man. We'll get off the topic, but I will just say she's had plenty of time to think of all those answers too. So that's true. That that's, that's the devil's advocate. Absolutely. Back when this happened, she didn't have answers for any of it, none of it. And, and that's why it was so suspicious. And now you have all these answers 15, 20 years later. Like, yeah. Yeah. I just say, check it out just so you can, I, 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 I found it very interesting. That's all. The, yeah. But I mean, the thing for me is that there's, there's nothing lower um, than someone that harms a child. Like there's a, there's a verse. I was, I was listening to a podcast today about a murder of a little girl called Maddie Clifton. I think her name was in 1998. She was an eight year old. And um, when the judge was doing the sentencing for the person that killed her, he like quoted this verse from the Bible that was basically like, um, for, I, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not getting it totally right, but he's basically saying that like for anybody that would hurt a child, like you deserve basically like the worst punishment. Like, Castration, to, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like you, you deserve like to be fucking crucified, like straight up. And it, it yeah, it's absolutely true. So like whether it was her and whether it was her dad and she was aware of it, she covered for her dad. She's still fucking as culpable and she should be in jail, whether she physically killed her or not, because if she had all the knowledge about it and didn't say anything, yeah, that's accessory. I mean, that's that it is. It's accessory. And, and I just don't know. I could never go with that. If it was my kid, I don't oh, care I have, if yeah. someone tried to intimidate me. 1000%. Uh, but yeah, guys, feel free to drop your uh, thoughts on Casey Anthony as well. <laughs> all right. So this is the severed feet mystery. In 2007, a girl was roaming a beach in British Columbia when she found a sneaker. Uh, there you go. To her horror, as she opened up the sock, she found that a human foot was inside. Since then, a number of severed feet had washed ashore. The feet have been connected to five men, one of them a woman, and three of unknown sex. Throughout the years... With a hoax foot thrown here and there, the cases have never com- been completely closed, with many theories floating around as to the feet as to who the feet belong to. The Vancouver police managed to identify one foot in 2008, matching its DNA to a man who d- who was described as suicidal. They later were able to match two other feet to a woman who was also believed to have committed suicide. Because of these findings, many speculate that the feet belong to those who jumped off the bridge to their death. However, because of the rarity of only feet and other body parts showing up, some believe that the feet were connected to a plane crash by a nearby island. Others suggest they were victims of the Asian tsunami in 2004. Since the make of the shoes were all manufactured before 2004, whatever sources these feet are coming from, they have left the world baffled for years. Um, wow. That's, that's interesting. I don't even know what to think about that. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of hard to make heads or tails from that. So all the shoes were before 2004. There was a tsunami that happened an Asian tsunami in 2004. Um, is there a chance that animal life were eating these bodies and stopped at the shoes? I mean, maybe. Are there piranha in these waters? Do they have piranhas out in like? They're I don't in know. Asia. They're in Asia. That could be something there. I, I don't yeah. know. This is a bizarre one. That yeah, that's weird. I don't even know what to make of that. Aside from, that's really weird. <laughs> Again, it says, because of the findings, many speculate that the fil- the feet belong to those who jumped off a bridge to their deaths. Well, how would that sever? Hmm. I don't know. That's interesting. The tsunami may have something to do with it for sure. Because if there was a tsunami in 04 and all the shoes were manufactured before 04, that's a pretty strong indication that... I don't know. I, I yeah, guess we'll have to move I, on from that one, man. That's a, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I, I <laughs> it's incredibly odd, but I don't know what to make of it. Like, 
Aliens. Um, there you go. Okay, dude, this one looks interesting. The title of this one is The Dead Woman Who Named Her Killer. So she solved her death I, from... I've seen... Oh, I've seen a preview for like a show or something like this that's like... um, how What's it called? How I Solved My Murder or some, uh -huh. something like that. There's like a show like this that it's like people like real stories of like how after the fact evidence or, or something like th that. Ah, yeah, this is okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this one looks interesting. Although this case has been solved, how it was solved remains a mystery. In 1977, a respiratory therapist in Chicago was murdered in her apartment. Teresita Bassa was found under a flaming mattress, a butcher knife buried into her chest. Police attempted to track her stolen jewelry, but with no luck. They also failed in trying to link any of the suspects to the crime. It seemed impossible to find the perpetrator. That is, until Remy Chua, a co-worker who barely knew the victim, involuntarily became a leading source of information. Okay, this is interesting. Chua began having frequent visions and nightmares about Bassa, the deceased victim. It started in the locker room of her work where she was experiencing seeing a man's face behind Bassa. This would repeat in her dreams. Chua then began channeling Bassa's spirit when conversing with her husband. When channeling Bassa's spirit, Chua told her husband the entire story of Bassa's murder. She claimed an orderly at the hospital named Alan Showery was helping Bassa with her television when he assaulted her. He then killed her and set her mattress on fire. The spirit was even able to give the details of what happened to the jewelry, which was given to Showery's common law wife. Mr. Chua convinced his wife to give these details to the police. The police were skeptical at first, but after seeing that boss's jewelry on Shuri's wife, the police were able to convict the man for 14 years in jail. Unfortunately, there was not enough evidence to convince him longer. Was, was it really boss's ghost who named the killer? Perhaps Chua had, had knew some facts in the case and disguised it as a spirit possessing her whatever led to the killer remains a mystery yeah i think that this chua person is absolutely full of shit that's the kicker here because if if we can't know like if we can't know whether or not this person had any prior knowledge and from our vantage point we literally can't so like where do you go from that? Um, being where we are, if we can't know that whether or not she had any prior knowledge, then you would say, okay, if she had no prior knowledge, devil's advocate, well then, yeah, it would have had to have been like a fucking ghost because like, how else do you pull this out of your ass? You, you literally can't unless you just like picked a random person. You were like, you know what? You did it. And then you came up with this elaborate thing. But it, I would be led to believe that this person did have prior knowledge. Um, and, and that's what it was. I don't think it was a spirit, but if it could be proven that they had no prior knowledge, then yeah. How else do you explain it? I mean, how else would you, you couldn't. You got to believe that Chua might have known this Alan Showery guy, the guy who killed her yeah, in some capacity. Hmm. I mean, yeah, but like I said, if we can't know whether or not they had prior knowledge, I mean, it's just like. It well, do you be believe in that sort of thing? Do you think that's possible to yeah. channel? Yeah, no, I don't think you're channeling anything. I think if that happens, I think that the that person is is they're trying to get someone to to um, hear them or or see them um 
they're trying to get their own murder solved. I think they, they, I do think that's a real thing. Um, there's a movie. It's not like this and it is, it's called the invisible. Um, and I really, really like it. It's, it's like a mystery thriller. It's, it's not a horror movie, but this kid gets beat to death. Almost. He's like literally comatose, like on the brink of death. And he's like literally stuck in, on the barrier between life and death. And his spirit is roaming free and he's able to break through to a person that's living. And he's like, he basically leads her on this goose chase to find his body before his heart stops. So his life can be saved. And, um, it's a it's a really good movie. I like it, but I that I do believe that just like general idea is a real thing. Like I do mm-hmm. th- think that that can happen because it goes back to what we talked about earlier about like what you think happens when you die. I've had enough paranormal experiences in my life to tell you that I, I don't know how you would explain it or or why, but there are definitely people that wander for for sure. Um, and maybe that's what happens if, you know, if you lived a shitty life, like there, maybe there isn't a hell you're just stuck wandering aimlessly on earth. Um, and, uh, and your soul can't rest. I, I, it is, but yeah, I, I do believe that's a real thing. Mm. Maybe there's something there. Yeah. Hold on. I gotta shut a door. All right, guys. In an effort to not have to edit this podcast, I would like to add, you should have seen by now my They Live 4K Steelbook review. And that is one of the best artworks I've ever seen. So if you haven't picked that up, definitely go and grab that because that thing is gorgeous. And I also got the Cloverfield 4K. If I haven't reviewed that yet in the channel, that should be coming soon. I'm very interested in rewatching that. But 10 Cloverfield Lane's an amazing Same film. Fucking Chua, and I was just thinking about Chewbacca. Um,. Now my brother fucking never latches the door and he's in there playing NCAA Bastard. basketball or whatever thing, whatever. And his fucking cat came out. So it was loud as fuck just hearing fucking basketball. So, there yeah. Uh, where are we at? 52 minutes. Okay. we got some more time. Let's go to a story called the boy in the box. Oh, boy. what's in the fucking box? Well, let's see if we can find out. It was the year 1957 in Philadelphia when a hunter found the bruised body of a boy in a J.C. Penny box. The boy, around four to six years old, was nude and wrapped in flannel. He seemed, yeah, he seemed to have died from a blows to the head. Fearing his musket traps would be confiscated by police, the hunter didn't report the body. Now, musket traps, are you familiar with that terminology? Is that some kind of, like, frowned upon illegal thing? Uh, Whatever it was back in the 50s, yeah. Okay, okay. But, But because of that, he did not report the body. It was two days later when a college student found the body. Then the police started on the case of America's Unknown Child. It immediately attracted the media's attention. And flyers of the boy were seen throughout the Pennsylvania area. Although police received thousands of leads, they were never able to recover the identity of the young boy. They tried cha- tracing back the J.C. Penny box and checking the boy's fingerprints, but everything led to a dead end. However, there were two promising leads of note. One lead involved a foster home located 1.5 miles away. Oh, shit. (laughs) A medical examiner who pursued the case until his death had a psychic lead him to the foster home where he found a bassinet similar to the one that was sold in the box. Hanging on the clothesline were blankets much like the one wrapped around the boy. He believed the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the home. And she didn't want to be found as an unwed mother. This was 57. Police interviewed the couple, but closed the investigation. In 2003, they opened a case again when interviewing a woman who identified as the letter M, who claimed her abusive mother 
bought the child back in 1954. According to her, her mother killed the boy in a fit of rage because M was mentally unstable. The investigation was closed as well, leading to the boy to the leading the boy to remain America's unknown child. Yes, yeah, so without a, without a shadow of a doubt, this uh, the kid the kid came from the foster home. You know, especially without an identity, because if your parents, if you're if you're a mother or a father whose child is missing, not only are you not only would the police find that out, they would have known before they found the kid that a kid was missing. If you're even a halfway decent parent. So this kid was <clears throat> uh, doomed from his birth. Probably yeah. got probably ha- whatever this pregnancy happened, probably nothing legal. Uh, the kid probably was born in a bathtub or something. No documentation, not in a hospital, no date of birth, no birth certificate. None of that probably happened. And this poor kid was, uh, he didn't stand, didn't stand a chance. Man. I don't think it's so much a mystery. I think that's just what happened. Born, yeah. Born into, uh, the port. system. Yeah. And unfortunately, that kind of shit happens a lot. You know, uh, you gotta you gotta wonder how negative the outlook was of being an unwed pregnant woman in the fifties. Like how negative nowadays? It's like what the hell? Most people have kids before they get married nowadays. It's just part of it. That's just the yeah. culture. It's not a bad thing. It's just you know, it's it's you know. But back then, what do you think the con- the perception was? Of- it, was a, it was a scarlet letter, <laughs> straight up. Like, um, yeah, no, it, it not only was it frowned upon, I, I think that that was the type of shit that would get you run out of a town. You know, you're you're a harlot. You know, you're, yeah. I mean, Basically that shit- being a witch in, in uh, isn't Salem. It, isn't it funny how that changed, you know, over – less than a hundred years, a hundred years ago, you were a, a, a whore, a harlot, disgusting. And now it's like, it seems like men, you know, like we as like men are like, yeah, fucking. Yeah. Yeah. All fuck. And it's just like, it's so crazy how that changed. I mean, neither one is right. Like neither one, like it, it's like, whether somebody chooses to do that or not is their choice. And, you know, it's not for you to make an opinion on whether or not that's the right or wrong choice, but it's just crazy how that's changed. But yeah, no, she would have been run out of fucking town. There you have it. There you have it. Um, this is called the Jeanette De Palma case. Mm. Speaking of witches. This is just a big coincidence right here. Usually, people connect witches to Salem, Mass. But for this particular case, the witches were in Springfield, New Jersey. It all started in... (laughs) It all started in... (laughs) What a a crazy... What a scary town, right? Springfield. (laughs) It all started in 1972 when a dog brought home... Did you ever... Have you ever been to Salem, Mass? But I want to go. I do too. I've never, I've never been up that way at all. Like Maine, Jersey, New York. I've never been up that way at all. Right. Okay. Uh, so let me start over. Usually connect people. Usually people connect witches to Salem, Massachusetts. But for this particular case, the witches were in Springfield, New Jersey. It all started in 1972 when a dog brought home a decomposed forearm home. This prompted a police search and a body was soon found afterwards atop a cliff in Springfield. The body was identified to be that of Jeanette De Palmer, a 16-year-old who had gone missing for six weeks. Immediately, rumors began to spread as the cause of her death. The hill where she was discovered was covered with occult symbols and many believed her body was placed on a makeshift altar. Many locals, even some police members, blame a coven of witches, otherwise known as Satanists, who used the Palma for a human sacrifice. Because of a flood, much of the case's details have since been destroyed. 
However, some reports from the local paper mentioned that police couldn't determine the cause of death due to her badly decomposed body. They had also investigated a local homeless man who was a prime suspect, only to find no connection with the killing. As for the occult theory, many believe that De Palma may have provoked a group of Satan-worshipping teens at her high school when she was trying to evangelize them. She was involved with a group who helped drug addicts by finding faith in Christ. The reverend who ran the group theorized that she was selected as a sacrifice to the group because of this. Was she a human sacrifice? Or did these suspicions help hide the real killer? Perhaps no one will ever know. So are, well, we, looking at, to are we looking at a cult? Are we looking at a murderer who tried to disguise the murder behind the idea of a cult? Probably or is there another murderer. possibility? Probably a murderer. I will say, though, to that, to your point, uh, to your story, you didn't show they actually they they actually have images of uh, the suspected witch. I, I found one. Oh, I um, I because <laughs> I, I, I I saw I saw you. Uh, yeah, I had up, Reagan uh, up there. Reagan. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I'm going to tell you a story. And you can believe me or you cannot believe me. I don't care, but I know what Christian I saw. He met a witch. He met a witch. There is a haunted school some ways away from me that I've visited before. But for my own privacy, I'm not going to say on this this show. I'll tell you after the fact if you care. It really doesn't matter, though, because <laughs> there's haunted schools everywhere. This is an abandoned, haunted school. The actual truth of this school is the school shut down in the early 80s because the location was very far from anything and most of the town dwellers lived on the outskirts outside of this place and started bringing their kids to closer schools in near nearer counties. The school then became, for a few years, a Baptist community college, but stayed open for two years. The school was then defunct from the late 80s on. The school is absolutely invisible unless you know where it is, and you literally park your car on the side of a dirt road where there is tall grass that you have to go through. And you stumble upon this school. The school is overgrown. The roofs are caved in. The floors are gone. The auditoriums have holes in the ceiling. It's been closed down for many, many years. It's haunting looking. It's terrifying. I went there one night with some friends. And... I'll never forget. We're being silly. I'm terrified. I'm a chicken shit. I get scared easily. I'll never forget. We go to the school this one night. And I saw in a distance a group of people in a circle with candles in the shape of a star upside down. And there was some kind of squealing sound going on. This was probably a hundred feet away. This is a big school, but I heard it. You're making you're making my eyes water, and you're making me get goosebumps because I have a story too. Yeah. Uh, whenever you can continue, but you just reminded me of a story. So, I mean, I'm pretty much done. Basically, what happened after that? I stopped in my tracks. Mind you, it's pitch black. The school is overgrown. You know, it's terrifying looking. They also had this lore of the, the school shut down because the janitor was hurting the children, to put it in so many words. It's not true. But this this legend has taken over the school with the graffiti art everywhere. And they write there's this one there's this one part of the school where somebody wrote in graffiti, they found out about me 
and it's terrifying looking, but there's graffiti all over the place. But I see from a distance this group, and it looked like they were wearing robes. I saw the candles in the shape of a star, and I heard a light squeal. Thank God they didn't notice me because I had taken the lead from the my group a little bit. I stopped in my tracks. I made sure I was very silent. I walked backwards. I told the guys, we have got to get out of here now. We have got to get out of here now. Do not ask me why. Don't fuck around. Let's go. They, they obliged. Thank God. We got out of there. I told them what I saw. None of them believed me. They all thought I was full of shit. They wanted to go back. I said, no, we're not going back. I, I started raising hell. I started yelling and screaming. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Sent the chill up my spine, man. I saw a cult that night. I know I saw an actual cult. So long story short, I believe that a cult could have killed this girl. Um, yeah. But that's a true story yeah. on my part. So it's funny you mentioned that because as you were talking about that, I thought of something. If any of you guys are familiar with the Cincinnati area at all, there was a factory called the Peter Cartridge Factory. We called it the Powder Factory because uh, they made gunpowder there in, uh, for World War One. And in 1918, I'm looking it up now. 19, I can't remember exactly when. 1918 or, or 19... Uh, shit. No. 1944, it was closed down uh, during World War II because there was an explosion. And uh, people died. And um, it had been, you know, abandoned and run down for 50, 60 years. And it became known as like one of the most haunted. Everybody said it was one of the most haunted places. And like it became a place for the occult, like the occult would go there. And I'll show you some pictures really quick of like the inside of it. Um, this is what the place looked like uh like modern day now they've since renovated it and uh it's actually become apartments but when i tell you this shit like oh here's a good picture of when it was run down of one of the sides of the building this was not even 10 minutes away from my house and uh to get to king's island you had to go right past it and there was like a 90 degree angle turn and then another one, like a winding road to go up this hill in just this wooded area right next to the factory. And if you were coming home from Kings Island, you would take the same way. If you were a local, if you weren't a local, you would just take the highway or whatever. But the locals always took it. My wife and I explored the powder factory uh, the first summer we ever got together. We went inside of it. We took pictures in the middle of the day. We got on the roof. Uh, it was really cool to be there during the day. I never walk through that place at night. You couldn't pay me enough money to walk through that place at night. Because even if you don't think the people that died there make it haunted or whatever, the fact that it's a hotbed for the occult, it doesn't fucking help. Um, and I have goosebumps talking about this because like one night we used to play a game, me and my older brothers and my older brother, those friends play like two hand touch football in the parking lot of Taco Bell over by Kings Island. One night we played till like 2 a.m. And we were, I was in a car with my older brother, Matt, and uh, his buddy, Chris Greenup. And we took the road through the powder factory to get back to the house. And we came down the winding road right as you're about to cross a bridge when you, when you're coming right up to the powder factory. And there was a bike trail. And as soon as we went across the bridge and the powder factory is right there, a line full of people in black robes with little candles. Hmm. I still remember it to this day. And it's actually like, I don't know what it is when I talk about stuff like this, like my eyes start to water and I get goosebumps. Cause like, I don't know if it's fear or what, but let me tell you something. One of the most scared instances I've ever had in my entire life. Because I didn't know what was about to happen. Are they going to be like, fuck, these people saw us. We're going to fucking sacrifice these people to Satan. No. They moved out of the way and let us drive. But they were headed toward the powder factory after 2 a.m. in all black robes, 
holding candles. And like, we always heard the stories when we were kids about that place. Don't go to that place at night. Like, don't, don't do it. And to see that was just something else. And when my wife and I went through it, um, oh, there were pentagrams, uh, graffiti pentagrams. There was, um, she actually has pictures on her phone of candles in the shape of a pentagram on one of the floors that had burned, you know, like burned down to the, to the foundation and stuff. Like, yeah, they were definitely doing some satanic shit there. So, uh, it's crazy that you have that story. Also, you mentioned something about that school, about how there was this rumor about the janitor and, and this and that, and that haunted school, you know, there's a haunted house in Ohio called the dent schoolhouse, right? You ever heard of it? No, it's a Halloween attraction. Um, I've been to it. I always thought the story about it was false. No, it was built in 1894, closed down in 1955, and was abandoned until the early 2000s when this family bought it to make it a Halloween, like haunted house attraction. Uh, in the 50s, Charlie the janitor um, was, kids were going missing. And uh, eventually students kept complaining about like nasty smells coming from the basement. Finally, one day when the like school staff went to check it out, Charlie had vanished and they found bodies of dozens of children oh. in the walls in the basement. And uh, when I first went there, I thought it was a bullshit story. That was just because it's a Halloween attraction. You're just trying to scare people. No, it's real. It really happened. Um, they never found the guy. He, he up and vanished. And uh, for years, he was killing kids and entombing them in the walls of the basement. And you can, every October, go through the Dent Schoolhouse as a haunted attraction. And uh, it's pretty macabre. You know, it's one thing to go to a haunted house. Um, for Halloween, you know, spooky. It's another thing to go through a literal haunted house where dozens of children died. Oh. Like, yeah. So, yeah. So, do you get a kick out of going to, or do you go to haunted legendary haunted places anymore do when you experience something like that like me did it tell you like you know i'm never i'm never going to a place like this again i'm not talking about an attraction i'm talking about an, an illegal private property owned abandoned you know like you were talking about like that place earlier just the, yeah, the peter cartridge factory which like i said has now been turned into luxury apartments which fuck that um i don't know man I don't know how you feel about this. So I kind of want to get your opinion on it. Um, I kind of something to happen to where I can, without a shadow of a doubt, no matter if anybody believes me, say, yeah, yeah, go surreal. Like, I, I, I kind of want that to happen. Um, but getting that to happen could entail the most terrifying experience of my life. So right. like on one hand, I'm like, I, I want that irrefutable proof, but at the same time, what would that do to me? Um, there's a place in Kentucky called Waverly Hills Sanitarium. I thought about going there many times. It's in the top 10 most haunted places in the United States uh, online. Yeah. Yeah. And it is an awful place where so many people died. And it is just, it just looks terrifying. And you can stay overnight. Uh, you can stay overnight with a tour guide and with a group if you're, you know, that scared or whatever. Or you can pay double and you and whoever you bring with you can go walk around the sanitarium all night by yourselves. No tour guide, <sighs> nothing. Yeah. And I, I have asked Brooke and she said she would do it. She was like, I would do it. The only hang up is I don't know if I would. I would need a few friends, not just me and her. Like I would want a group of people to do it because I wouldn't want a tour guide. Fuck that. No, don't show me around. Let me explore this place on my own. But I would want at least like four friends. And I don't know why it matters because strength in numbers doesn't matter when it comes to fucking ghosts and demons. <laughs> but like it would just make me feel better, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it's like $150 to, 
to do it without a tour guide and just for you like you get there at like i think it's like 10 p.m and you have free reign until 7 a.m um and you can explore whatever you want but mm. i've read reviews about it i've watched videos on it i've read it yeah it, that place is haunted as fuck um yeah it's like alcatraz you can stay overnight at alcatraz no yeah but but do you know what i mean though do you know what I mean about like that 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 incessant need to be like I want proof. Like I want this proof, but like getting that proof might make me shit my pants. Mhm. Mm or is that just me? Like, well, I my fear is too strong that I'd rather respect the idea of it and not really just I'd rather I it's kind of goes like I don't fuck with Ouija boards and things like no, that. Never, never will. Because even though I can't prove ghost demons are real, I respect the idea that it's possible. I obviously, I believe, I think I've seen cults. I'm telling you, I know what I saw the way you did. I saw a cult that night. You don't, you don't forget it. You'll never forget it. And I, I, and no I hate thinking about it. You. I really, no, I know it. <laughs> yeah, it fucks me up. I hate thinking about it. Cause I always say, what if one of them saw me and they were, you know, Anyway, but no, I, 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 I think I would scar me. I'm so scarred just from that. I, I don't, I would, I don't, I don't go to anything like that anymore. I just, I want no part of it. So I Christian, really if, if, if we got a gang of YouTubers from Kentucky, you know, Piz, Jake, Justin, mid-level media, you name it, people that are in that area, we all get together and we're like, let's all go stay the night at Waverly Hills together. You wouldn't do it. I mean, I wouldn't do it. Not on the experience in some way, just to hang out. Mm -hmm. But imagine getting shit faced too. That'd be the only <laughs> no, way I could get through the night. Yeah, like, do you even think you'd be scared? Like, oh shit, guys, this is a fucking ghost. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. I you, you you hear some of these people's experiences. Like, people can say what they want about religion. And about like demonic possession and stuff. But like you hear some of these people that experience that or like family and friends that witnessed those kind of things happen and they will swear till the day they die. Yeah. Like, no, that was not in their head. Like people's bodies don't contort those ways. People don't speak pig Latin out of thin air. Like there's just, there's things that you can't explain. And mm. But I do, I do, I want that fucking proof. Like, I want it so bad. So I can just at least go to my grave, like, go the rest of my life going, I know for a fact there's something after this life. So y'all can be the assholes you want to be. You're, you know, But yeah, dude. I mean, have you ever had, like, a, the, the, you know, have you ever had a truly, like, haunted experience? Like a ghost? In, or... Even if you can't say it was a ghost for sure, something that you think to this day that was probably paranormal. I think for sure, man. I I I swear to God, there have been moments in my life where I could feel something was either in the room with me. I, I've had conversations with Sydney about this. This is our own unsolved mysteries now, but um, it's what the people want. I've talked to Sydney about this because I've shared moments I've had where I swear to God, I felt something near me in the room or I felt eyes on me. And she's always said, well, you know, Christian, think about the stuff you collect. Think about the things you have. Think about our house, how old some of this stuff is. Like for this chair I'm sitting in, this is this beautiful leather chair that belonged to Sydney's grandfather who passed away in 1997 or eight. And that's just, this is one item of a hand-me-down we have. We have a lot of stuff like this. I've collected a lot of movies and old movies and stuff that belong to people across the world. What if, the, she's like, what do you ever think about this, Christian? Do you ever think that maybe you could feel the presence of somebody or something? And it's because they just want to see their stuff that you have now. And they want to see if it's being taken care of. They want to see if it's in good hands. And you're feeling that. And I was like... There's part of me that sometimes I'm like, you got a point city there. There could be something there. But for me, it always feels haunting and, and like, it's not friendly whenever I feel it. I, uh, I, 
I really think that there is evil that walks the earth that we can't see. I, if, if I don't know that ghosts walk the earth or not, but I certainly think that there is evil that I, I don't, I just don't know, man. Yeah. I no, think that I, there's I, evil out there. I, th- I swear to God, I have felt it in my life before. I felt something in the room with me at different. My points. wife, my wife believes that she is haunted. Um, she talked about how she felt like our house was haunted for the longest time. And I always told her, I've never experienced anything here. And I sit on this couch and watch me on right now in the middle of the night, all the time by myself in the dark. And I've never experienced anything, but right after our son was born, she was rocking him in his uh, chair in his room and breastfeeding him to get him to sleep. He was only, I don't even think he was a month old. And I was at work. She told me about it when I got home and she was so shook up about it. But she was just in there in the dark with his sound machine playing and rocking him. And she said the chair just turned like 90 degrees. Like she just fucking turned. And um, she said it freaked her out. She said she like, she screamed. Um, And... um, She's talked about in her apartment now how she's had experiences, uh, how she was dozing off in the bathtub one night, not dozing off, like falling asleep, but like just getting comfortable, had her eyes closed and she felt something like caress her leg. And uh, she's told me about a lot of experiences that uh, and and now she's like led to believe that like she thinks she's haunted um, and what, you know, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um I can tell you the scariest thing that ever happened to me was when I was 17, we lived in this old house on a street called Hill Street. Uh, there was an old house, had an unfinished basement. And um, I used to fall asleep watching football highlights during football season uh, on the couch in the family room because I was working at Chipotle at the time as a kitchen manager my senior year of high school. And, um, I'd get, so I'd get home late and I would just watch TV, you know, football highlights and then pass out. And, um, one night, uh, I was laying on the couch and I was falling in and out of sleep. I was almost there and, uh, my eyes were closed and I was on my side and I could have swore I heard somebody whisper my name in my ear. And I was like, this is one of my brothers like fucking with me or whatever. And I like turned and there was nobody there. And like two of my brothers didn't even live at home anymore. So I didn't know like, why would I think that anyway, but whatever. So I turned back on my side and I heard it again, but this time it wasn't like whispered. It was like spoken in my ear. Um, I'll never forget how it sounded too. Cause it sounded very like, God, I don't even know how to put it. It, it wasn't playful. Uh, and this time I shot up. And uh, not even kidding you, Christian, looking across the kitchen, that basement door opens mm-hmm. and just swings open. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I still can't explain it to this day. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Um, told my mom about it. And you know what she did? I don't know if your mom was ever like this. She went out and bought olive oil and blessed the house. Uh yeah, that's a real thing over here in Ohio, I guess. Growing up, maybe it was something from her parents that you like put crosses on like the windows and the doors and you say a prayer over them and stuff and you like bless the house. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so my mom did that like a few days later because she believed me because I I, I, mean, I was shook up about it, dude. I was like, I no, fuck that. I went and felt I went in her room and laid on her floor <laughs> and that's where I went oh. to sleep after that happened. I, I was like, fuck this, like no way. No, but that's, isn't that funny that that's our reaction? Like, let's get near someone or let's close and lock a door. Like that's going to stop a fucking ghost. <laughs> like, oh shit, they closed the door. I can't get in. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. Mm. You know, the only other thing I want to, I would add about all this is my grandpa. Uh, he's 80 now doing great. He, uh, healthy as an ox, but. In 1989, he had 
triple bypass and he was dead for I think seven minutes. Massive heart attack. And growing up, my mom used to always say, Oh, you Pap, we call him Pappy. He would she Dude, would always that's what say we call that's what we call Dave's dad, Pappy. Yeah. Yeah. And my mom would always say, you know, Pappy sees ghosts. And uh I was like, no, nah, it's funny, whatever. And my mom would never say I'm just kidding, but I would never take it too seriously. And I remember I would ask him about this when I was young, and he would say, oh, yeah, I see him. I see him. And it's funny. I'll never forget. I never talked to him about this very much, but it was probably five, six years ago. I'm 20. What was I five, six years ago? 24, 25. And um, I remember I was driving him somewhere we were going somewhere together just me and him and i said pappy can i ask you something and like i, I look I, i'm an adult now i really want you to give it to me straight like no no games like he's like well, yeah what is it i said do you, do you really see do you really see stuff and without hesitation he goes yeah i was like well what do you see and he told me the first thing he said to me was he goes well christian let me tell you something I truly think that when I died, I, he goes, the only way I can explain it, it's as if there's a filter in reality that got taken away and I can see more of what's really here. And I was like, what do, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, let me put it to you like this. Once a week when I go, when we go, when, when me and your grandma are in bed, once a week, I wake up to seeing a silhouette of this person caressing your grandma's hair. And it scared me the first time First time I saw it until I finally worked up the courage to bring it up to your grandma because I, well, I didn't want her to think I was crazy. And I was like, well, well what did she say? She, just, she started crying. And I was like, what do you mean she started crying? He goes, well, when I told her what the goat, what the silhouette was doing, your grandma told me my mom used to do that to me when I was a kid going to bed. She would just caress my hair. And Pappy said, that's what this person's doing. That's what this thing's doing to you. And so my grandma th thinks that that's her mom as a ghost, you know, just keeping her eye on Mimi. And I said, well, do you see anything else? And he goes, yeah. And he didn't answer me. He just said, yeah. I said, well, 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 what is it? My grandpa is the most honest, hardworking person I've ever met in my life. Just, I've never seen him lie about anything. And he goes, well, the other thing I see, in his bedroom, he used to tell me he saw this all the time pre-Katrina. So in our, his house in New Orleans... He had a master bedroom. His bedroom was this rectangle. And on the left was his bathroom. And in the bathroom was uh, another 15 feet in length from the door from his bedroom. So there's a little bit of depth in the, in the bathroom. And there was a nightlight by the toilet that would hit the back side of the wall in the bathroom. <clears throat> and I remember... I was like, well, what did you see? He goes, it hasn't happened in very, very long time since since Katrina. But he goes, well, about 2003, 2002, I remember I started seeing somebody in a cloak and they had a hood on. And mind you, this all sounded silly to me when he's telling me this, but he's dead ass serious. This man's never lied in his life. And I was like, what did he do? I, I would just see it. And I remember the first time I thought, I thought somebody was in the house. So I reached, I reached in my door, my little thing to pull out my handgun. And as soon as my foot just barely came out of the covers, gone. And then I was like, well, did you start seeing it a lot? He goes, I wouldn't see it. Maybe I'd see it one night. Then maybe uh, a couple weeks later, I'd see it again. And I was like, well, what, what was going on? He goes, well, it started getting closer and closer every time I'd see it. 
till eventually it was almost by the doorway from the bathroom. And uh, I was like, well, what happened? He goes, well, Katrina happened. And I haven't seen it since. And I was like, so what do you think? What do you think it meant? And he goes, well, I think it was the Grim Reaper telling me my time's coming because every time I saw him, he was closer to me. But I, I never saw him since Hurricane Katrina. And I was like, well, did you talk to Mimi about this? And he goes, yeah, I did. And I said, well, what did she say? And she said, well, she put she put something in perspective that I think answers the question as to why I stopped seeing the Grim Reaper. And I was like, well, what did what did she say that made you think that? He goes, your grandma and I weren't going to leave for Katrina. We were going to stay. We were going to ride out the storm because we didn't think it was going to hit. And I think what that Reaper meant was you're about to die because you're not going to leave. And luckily, I had the conversation with your grandma about this before the storm happened. And we evacuated. And we went with y'all and your family because we were leaving. My, my parents, they were, my mom's a hypochondriac in life. So bad weather comes. She's, you know, putting herself in the tub with cast iron pots on her head. But they left with us. And so now I'm led to believe that if my grandparents had stayed, my grandma might have survived somehow the storm, but my grandpa would have died. So it's there. There's, I know this was very long winded. I apologize. I hope it was interesting for the listeners, but. He, that is interesting. He he, because of the fact that he was legally dead for a few minutes, I I really think that might give him the ability to see stuff. I mean, to me, it's very plausible. And why would my grandpa lie to me, a twenty five year old kid at the time? I still talk to him to this day, and I've actually said, "Pappy, do you mind if I interview you and just put a do a cha- episode where I ask you these questions?" from my YouTube. And he says, absolutely. No problem. If you ever want to, no problem. I got no, I got no reason to lie. So when you know somebody that's very honest and you know, they're earnest and they tell you this stuff, man, it really gets into your thought process of maybe this shit, maybe there is, dude, maybe there, you know, I mean, Dan Aykroyd, the ghostbuster legitimately believes in ghosts. Like he legitimately 1000% believes in it on a scientific level too. And the way atoms and, 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 and things work and molecular activity and how it's true. You could really, you can really physically get the data for a ghost in a room and things like that. This, he's like, this technology exists. Why are we even talking about the, uh, the idea of ghosts? We can, we can technologically figure this stuff out with, with equipment. He, he dead ass believes it. So, I don't know, man. This whole this whole stuff freaks me out talking about it, quite frankly. But my grandpa made me a believer. I, I think that there is spirits and there's there's shit, man, that we can't see. There could be something in this room right now. I have no idea about. Well, if if when we die, we are just ghosts. Think of how many people have died throughout history. The chances would tell you that, yeah, there's probably multiple ghosts in this room with you as is there's probably multiple ghosts in this room with me. Um, That would also tell you that 99% of them are docile. They don't want to fuck with you. That's, you know, that's not, that's not their goal. Um, I'll leave you guys with this last story. I was texting my buddy while Christian was talking um, a few minutes ago. I was going to call him. I was going to put him live on the podcast. My buddy, Phil, he didn't reply, so then I texted my buddy Kyle. I was going to put him live on the podcast on the phone and have him tell this story for you guys so you know I'm not full of shit. Um, there used to be an app that it was some audio app. I can't – Audacity. That's what it was called, Audacity, where you could just record audio. My buddy Dave had it on his laptop. Dave's great-grandpa died in his house. Um, that his – it's been in his family for generations. And he had an unfinished basement that was outside the house. I don't know if you ever seen basements like this, Christian, that are like um, the entrance to the basement is a stairwell in the garage. So you have to go outside and go down the steps in the garage to get to the basement. So it's technically not even like a part of the house. Mm-hmm. And that was our chill spot. It's where we drank beer that we stole from Dave's dad and smoked cigarettes that we stole from Dave's dad and 
made out with girls when we were teenagers. That was that was our spot. Dave always told us his house was haunted because his grandpa died there in the fucking rocking chair that was in their dining room. He died in that chair that was still there. And uh, or great grandpa. <clears throat> and um, one day we said, fuck it. Phil set up the laptop, started recording Audacity. And we just spoke out loud and we said, you know, if there's anybody here, you know, let us know, make your presence known, blah, blah, blah. And then we went inside. We went up the stairs through the garage and went into the house and we let it record for an hour. We went upstairs and we played rock band. Um, we came down, Phil stopped recording and just through the audio file to see disturbances in the audio. And I tell you guys about the layout of the basement. So, you know, that it is not connected to the house. So you're not going to hear anything that's happening in the house. And there was nothing in that basement. It's, it's an old ass unfinished basement. Phil found two disturbances in the uh, audio file the entire time. And it was a few minutes in. First one was like almost inaudible. It was kind of like, <laughs> like it was weird. And we were like, okay, what the fuck? <laughs> when I tell you this second one, how we all reacted. I was going to call Kyle or Phil so they could tell you. And Kyle, I know you're listening to this episode right now because I know you listen to the podcast. So fuck you for being in bed. Um, we, um, Phil found the second disturbance in it and clear as day, a man's voice said, I'll never forget it. What do you want? Mm. And he like was very stern about it. Like, what do you want? Just like that, soon as we heard it, Phil grabbed the laptop. We grabbed our two liters of Mountain Dew and everything, went upstairs, and our buddy Dino, who was with us, looked at us and said, I am never sleeping in that basement again. And we all agreed, and we never did. From that point forward, we never slept in that basement again. And we always did when we went to Dave's house. That was where we slept. We never did again. And uh, all five of us, Heard it clear as day. And people go, well, like, why, why would they say that? Because we literally asked if there was anything here, talk to us, like make yourself known. Um, and it was almost like the first one sounded like this disembodied voice. Like it couldn't muster up what it was trying to say. And then just a few seconds later, it was as crystal fucking clear as we're coming through to you guys. Um, and I wish I could have gotten a hold of one of them right now. So I could have had them verify this story, but and Dave doesn't believe in ghosts. He's atheist. Uh, and you know what he thought? Still to this day, he'll tell you, I can't explain it. I don't know. He did years ago believe when he was still Christian and everything. But since he's become an adult, he's an atheist. But he still can't refute that story. Like, he, he can't. He has no explanation for it because he heard it clear as day, too. He was like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I can't explain it. And like I said, we all went inside and played rock band. We were all together. There was nobody mm -hmm. else in that house. So you tell me what it was because I still don't know to this same day. So unsolved mysteries from Christian and Nick's lives. Pretty much. <sighs> yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, man. That's some heavy shit tonight. It was. Christian's going to fucking go to sleep with the nightlight on. He's going to ask Sydney if they can sleep with the TV on. I I actually can't sleep in silence and pitch black. It's deafening to me. Me neither. Brooke always hated it. Um, that I, I would always fall asleep with the TV on. And it's not even, I don't even sleep with it on to where I can really hear it. It's just like white noise to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. God damn. Well, guys, um, this was a different both, episode for sure. We're both gonna try to sleep tonight. Yeah, these this is real life horrors. This is these real, are life. real life horrors. Yeah. We talk to you guys about fictional horror all the time. I have a feeling that some of you guys listened to this episode and ate this shit up. And if you did, I want you to leave a comment down below and just tell us some of your paranormal stories. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us if you liked this and if this is something you'd like us to do maybe every now and then. Um, because this stuff's really cool. I like it. I like the creepy. I like the macabre. And uh, 
There's nothing better than when it's real. Uh, Cause that shit's spooky. Mm. So uh, we need to address something before we wrap up. Uh, we will do the, the addendum to the top 100 horror movie list. It's just going to take some time. Yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah, I don't have the time right now to sit down and make really 50 movies. I think we're going to do some kind of combination thing or both just do a top 50 and, and mm -hmm. give you, I, I think that's what we're going to do, but even still, it's going to take some time to assemble that. I'm going to change my mind a bunch and we're going to do that, but it's just, I don't, it's, it's finding the time to sit, sit down and do that is not easy. I mean, we, we both got our own YouTube channels to run. I've got a million things going on. Nick's got a lot going on. That's something that I can only tackle piece by piece. So we'll do that, but it may not be for a few episodes, but hang in there. I promise it'll happen and we'll do it live. So that way I'll make it special for you guys. So we'll give our top 50 each live. We'll do 10 each or something like that and go down for the sure. list. So we'll yeah. do that live. That way it'll be special. So yeah. Hell yeah. Guys drop down your comments below. Let us know your unsolved mystery. In your own life. We all have one. Let us know if any of you guys were in the uh, cult that Christian and I saw. <sighs> Let us know. They could they could be listening. That could be. They've been listening this whole time, Christian. They have. With that being said, this has been another week of the You Need a Horror Podcast. Have a great night. Have a great morning. Great day. Whenever you're finishing this. And as always, we'll see you next time. Take or care. Will we?